It's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, my hometown. It's been cloudy and cold and dismal, quiet. It's a hard time of year back where I come from, March. It's more like an illness than a month. <laughs> Spring is almost here, but you can't really be sure. It's a difficult time when our Christian faith is at a very low ebb indeed, and all of those triumphant hymns seem utterly not quite true. And the ones about the beauty of the earth, give me a break, they're not even close. <laughs> don't have anything to do with anything. It just seems as if the resurrection, which is scheduled for two weeks from today, <laughs> may not take place. It seems, it seems unlikely. In, in March. I'm not sure why. There are different ideas why this month is so hard on us back there and gives us the blues so badly. One reason, I think, is that people where I come from are really the same as country people everywhere, anywhere in the world. They're very gentle because they come from a culture where people handle large animals. And when you handle large animals, you don't handle them suddenly <laughs> or loudly. It's just low and slow all the way. An animal who is confined already is nervous enough inside without your adding to it at all. So low and slow and easy does it is the way we're brought up. Even after generations away from the farm, we still keep these habits that are gained from working with large animals. This is the main difference between New Yorkers and Midwesterners, is that New Yorkers are 200 years removed from horses and cows. And so they are able, which is a useful thing now and then, in dealing with people to be shrill and sharp and to express anger. The people back where I'm from can't do this. We are unable to. This note is not on the trumpet that God gave us. <laughs> we're slow talkers and we're easygoing people and we're crippled by this sort of affability. We're unable to express disagreement and we get along the rest of the year because we have humor, but in March, humor is dead. <laughs> it's gone. There's no more of it. And so we are depressed and we're helpless in the face of this gray, cold month. Lyle Tollefson, the science teacher up at the high school, finally gave in to the pleadings of his children and went and bought a big, deep satellite dish for the television and had then to go next door to his brother-in-law, Carl Krebsbach, and ask him to hook it up. What a humiliation. Lyle knows a lot about Andromeda and the Milky Way and a lot about the sex life of the moth, but when it comes to mechanics, he's kind of helpless. So Carl came over to hook up the satellite dish for the TV he did it without even glancing at the directions which Lyle had been studying all day. <laughs> and as Carl left, he said over his shoulder, he said, uh, you're going to have to uh, paint uh, this summer, otherwise your siding will have to be replaced. Uh, and uh, if I were you, I would check your roof up there. Which to Lyle was the toll of doom. So the thought that he has to go out this next summer and paint his house and have everyone in Lake Wobegon drive by and look at him do it and think to themselves, what sort of man is it who can't put paint on a house? <laughs> He's depressed. March, a man who's... 48 years old. He weighs 200 pounds. That's 15 pounds more than he weighed last September. 
his hair is getting thin and he's been applying Rogaine every day at about <laughs> $80 a month and no results so far. He's been doing that for four months and he feels miserable about teaching. He doesn't like kids anymore. He's not sure that he ever did really. It's hard work. They're so tiring. They just eat you up. It's like wild dogs at the carcass of a lion. Just <laughs> eat the bones. And all of the television shows that his children are now watching off this satellite, there are 90 channels, 24 hours a day, that they can now see on this thing. And most of it just utter garbage and trash and other things that are weird, too, he doesn't want to know about, like the surgery channel. <laughs> no. He doesn't want to go into that room or the courtroom channel where you can watch people weep and, and sob and you can see vicious criminals sitting at a table, people who've cut their mother into thousands of pieces and put her into baggies and frozen her in a snowbank, sit there and they don't look that different from anybody else on television. <laughs> They don't look that different from the salesmen on the shopping channels where they, where they have the $39 diamond rings that are perpetually on sale. Everybody on television looks like a convicted criminal. They all sort of have that look of false affability about them, a desperate desire to look normal. No, he didn't care for any of that. And then he saw Clarence Bunsen coming toward him on the street the other day, and Lyle just turned and ran. Clarence could understand why. It's a hard month for Clarence, too, because he has become the chairman of the Lake Wobegon Lutheran Church Building Fund Drive. <laughs> he knew it was going to happen. He stayed away from church all of January. And he stayed away February. He was the chairman in the last two big fund drives. Back in 1962 and 1978, he was the chairman. And they hit him a third time. <laughs> Pastor Inkvist found him at his office. And he came and he said, Clarence, shear my sheep. And <laughs> Clarence said, no, please. Let this chairmanship pass from me. But they insisted they do it. Oh, it's a miserable job. $200,000 they have to raise for this building. There's no way around it. It's $200,000. It's a beautiful wood frame building with a high spire. One of the loveliest things in town. It was erected by our Norwegian forebears more than a century ago. They were so proud of it. But it would be cheaper far to tear this thing down and to build a brick shed, a church that's based on McDonald's. Just put one up and go in it every Sunday like cattle into a chute. But we can't do it because this is our beauty. This is our life. We can't lose this. And so we have to raise all of this money and he has to go around to all of these people and they sneak away from him and he has to chase them down. <laughs> and then when they're finally cornered, they turn and with a big smile, they make what they consider to be a generous offer of a gift that might even deserve a plaque. Two hundred dollars. <laughs> and he has to look him in the eye and say, your share is twelve hundred dollars, bud. <laughs> Twelve hundred dollars, two hundred dollars doesn't make it. Got to be more than that. People plead, and he has to put the thumbscrews to them. Twelve hundred dollars, that's what he told Lyle. Lyle said, well, I've been kind of short lately, but he knew he couldn't get away with that because this is a small town and people know about these things. And Clarence knew about that satellite dish and he knew how much he'd actually paid for it. <laughs> and it was more than that. So Lyle did what he had to do and he 
started doing extracurricular things at school. They get $40 a day for those things, serving as chaperones, chaperoned the snowball, and he went with the debate team up to the tournament up in Duluth, and he took the junior class on a field trip down to Chicago, and he took a bunch of kids down to Moorhead for the regional basketball tournament. <laughs> Not work that he especially enjoys. Kids are hard. They're hard to be around. They smirk far too much. They're far too cool, and they're not easy to be with. But he went with them. And one can be grateful for them. So often, they have such pure feelings sometimes, young people do, that to us, old, tired, discouraged people in the month of March, our children amaze us with how intensely they feel things, especially at a basketball tournament. You go to a basketball tournament and you hear that high-pitched shriek, this intensity, as our team is on the floor and it all comes down to this moment and these children are screaming as somebody's child goes up to take the shot and the ball hangs in the air, and all of life hangs on that ball in the air. And it should go in, but it does not go in. And it goes boing <laughs> off the plexiglass, and the buzzer sounds, that hard buzzer, and people on the other side all leap up and scream and throw their arms around each other, and we sit in stunned silence in pain, and our cheerleaders weep openly, and their mascara runs down their faces, <laughs> and they turn their stunned, beautiful faces to the heavens, and they sob, and our team slouches off the floor, exhausted, perspiring, beaten a game that will last forever in their memories. It can never be recovered. Everything is lost. And then 10 minutes later, we see somebody, a girl from Lake Wobegon, flirting with a boy from the other side. <laughs> Treason. <laughs> Treachery, how could she? But you do have a sense of life continuing. Of things going on after life has stopped. You can be grateful to kids for this when you become discouraged with the brutality and the violence and the cynicism and the piggishness of people. You look at young people and you can be so excited sometimes. Even teachers who've been in the trade for a long time. So he did all these things at $40 a crack, was glad for the money, saved it up for the Lutheran Church. And then last Monday, the principal at school, Mr. Halverson, came by the science classroom and he said, Lyle, he said, I want you to make sure you sit up front for the assembly today. And he gave him a wink. And Lyle knew that he was going to have to endure being given an award. <laughs> the Teacher of the Month Award, which is such a joke in a school with 20 teachers. It really is <laughs> ridiculous. And Halverson makes such a big deal out of it, and he gives such a big spiel about dedication and quality and excellence and everything. But Lyle went, and he sat down front. And he got so nervous as Mr. Halverson was giving the speech that he started to work around with his nose a little bit. <laughs> you know how it is when you've got a real big one in there that <laughs> you... It's hard to keep your hands off it, and you know that you shouldn't. This is a disgusting thing to do in public. But he was nervous, and he started to work around with it a little bit. There are crusted ones that don't, that you can't blow out. 
easing that thing around. And then he saw Mr. Halverson peering down at him over the lectern. As he was talking about excellence, Mr. Halverson was looking down at his teacher and seeing this man is cleaning his nostril. He looked at him with disgust, but it was too late because it was now on his finger. And you can't put him back in once you start to get him out. So he started to unreel this. And it was a lot more than he thought. It was big. It was like a quart. I mean, it was immense. This was a long thing. It went way down in his leg somehow. He pulled it out and he could feel his shoes got loose when he got this thing out. And he had no handkerchief. It was just all right there in his right hand. And then there was applause. And he stood up and he walked up to the lectern. And Mr. Halverson held out his right hand to shake hands with him. And he had to, Lyle had to put out his left hand. So it looked like they held hands. And Halverson looked at him in disgust again. And Lyle leaned into the microphone and he said too loud, too close to the microphone, thanks a lot. So it sounded like artillery. And people winced and he waddled off the stage embarrassed. Well, there's the month of March. A man with snot in his hand. That's what March is all about. But it will pass. It was warm for just about two days. And then it ended. And it got cold and chilly and cloudy and dismal, depressing and awful again. Spring is not yet started out there in Lake Wobegon. It's sort of like March was such a success, they decided to hold it over, you know, a couple, <laughs> couple more weeks into April, which happens sometimes. It's the month, as we say back home, that uh, God designed to show people who don't drink what a hangover is like. And uh, <laughs> that's, about, that's about what it's been like there the last uh, month and a half. It's so gorgeous for somebody from Lake Wobegon to come down south at this time of year. It's overwhelming, really. You walk into a restaurant and the waitress asks you how you are, how you all doing today. And you think immediately of unwise relationships. <laughs> it's a very seductive place to come, especially knowing what you're going to go back home to up in up in Lake Wobegon. Dismal, dark and cloudy, gray, not a bit of color, so flat. The sky, you stand out on your back porch and look out and the sky looks like gray linoleum up there. <laughs> Smells like, like God is fumigating the world. It's just <laughs> so awful. You sit and you watch television. What else is there to do? And you you realize that you've been watching it for a long time. That's the frightening thing, is that you realize you've been there for hours looking at this screen and getting the willies, which I always get watching television because I know that half of the audience are people in nursing homes and hospitals <laughs> who are too weak to get to the television. It's on a high turntable up in the corner of the room. They're lying in bed, sit and watch a talk show about transvestite grandparents or something, and you... It doesn't matter, really. They turn on the television in rest homes because after you've watched it for a while, death doesn't seem that far to go somehow. Just... No. It's dreadful and it's horrible. It's a hard thing, the month of March. But it's not so bad if you're from Minnesota. See, it would be unbearable for somebody from Tennessee. It'd kill you. You'd die. You'd be in a rest home. 
if you had to go through March in Minnesota. But for a Minnesotan, it's just part of life, you know. And how do you separate one part from the other? The good from the bad, you take it all. In fact, the thing that's worse, I think, than the month of March are people who will do anything to escape it and to get away from the blues and away from sadness. Sadness is a part of life, you know. And if you don't learn how to enjoy sadness, you're going to miss out on a lot. Because <laughs> it's going to be there. So you might as well learn to get into it, to participate in it, to share it with other people, <laughs> like I'm doing right now, and to enjoy it. Boredom and sadness and depression, they're part of life. There's too much entertainment in the world. You know that, don't you? <laughs> and we need to accept a little bit of sadness. Those guys who sit in the sidetrack tap are down there because they're trying to get away from the month of March. Men drink in my town so that they can be funny. There's Nothing funnier than a man who is just beginning his second drink. But then we want too much. We go too far, always, and we fall off the cliff. We want too badly to be wonderful all of the time, and we can't be. So here's March. In my town on Main Street, they're on the corner of Main Street and Taft Avenue, just about a half block south of the sidetrack tap, on the corner where the old red brick building is that used to be the locker plant. It hasn't been anything for a long time. There's a payphone sitting there on the corner. Lyle, the science teacher, was trying to start his car one day. He was parked on Main Street. and. He was trying to start it over and over and over again. It wouldn't start. It wouldn't start. He got furious. He got out of his car. He circled it twice. He was about ready to kick it. And then he heard the phone ringing in the payphone. It rang seven times. And finally, he went over there, and he answered it. And a man in a growly voice said, Stop pumping the gas. You're flooding it. And hung up. <laughs> now, nobody knew who this was. He didn't know. He didn't recognize his voice. But it must have been somebody from our town. Clarence Bunsen was walking down the street once, and the phone rang, and he picked it up, and the guy said, green plaid pants don't look that good on you. <laughs> that was all. For a long time, these guys thought that this guy was only talking to them. The subject doesn't come up in conversation, you know. You don't turn to somebody else in the sidetrack tab and say, have you been getting anonymous calls on the payphone down the street? You don't say that. <laughs> Guys thought this guy was just calling for them. They would avoid that corner. And then one day they'd forget and walk by. The phone would ring, they'd pick it up. He'd say, haven't seen you for a while. <laughs> We're curious who this guy is. Nobody has any idea. He must live in our town, we think. So the phone booth is falling apart. It's rusting. Half of the bolts have rusted away. It's falling over, partly. The door is rusted open. The glass is cracked. But we're reluctant to tear this phone booth down. I've only heard from him once, and that was during the month of March. And I was standing there and feeling miserable, looking out at this gray linoleum sky, standing on the corner, and the phone rang, and I picked it up. And he said, it isn't that bad. And besides, you're not the only one. And I've remembered that. It's not so bad, and besides, you're not the only one.